this is the second video in my series on fluids and electrolytes, acid-base disturbance. In the previous video, we had an introduction and we talked about active transport and passive transport, which is diffusion. Today, let's talk about water and body fluid compartments. Are you ready? Let's go. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, your favorite medical channel, and there is now a playlist called Acid Base Fluids and Electrolyte Disturbance. In this amazing series, we're gonna talk about lots of topics. We are still here. Just would like to let you know that I write different types of notes. You can get them by going to patreon.com forward slash medicosis. Cell membrane transport is either passive, we don't need ATP, or active where we need ATP. Passive is also known as diffusion. There are three types, simple diffusion, osmosis, which is simple diffusion for water, and facilitated diffusion. So simple diffusion, no carrier, osmosis, again, no carrier, facilitated, it needs carrier. If you have a carrier, you have three things, structural specificity, competition, and saturation. Active transport needs ATP, either carrier active transport or vesicular transport. The carrier can be primary active when you exert energy, when you consume ATP by yourself. Or you can be secondary active, you need energy, but you don't exert energy by yourself. You depend on the primary active to supply the ATP. And the great example of the train, primary active, secondary active, and here is the carrier protein, with ATPase activity to break down the ATP into ADP and phosphate to release energy. Three types of that, uniport, symport, and antiport. Now pause the video and in the comment section, please write an example of each. Example of uniport, an example of symport, an example of antiport. Let's answer the questions of last time. So, how many types of ATPase pumps in your body? I know four. If you know more than that, let me know. Sodium potassium ATPase, it's in every single cell. Calcium ATPase in the muscle. Hydrogen ATPase in the kidney. Hydrogen potassium pump in the stomach. It's also known as the proton pump. It's what secretes acid. The second question match. I have four different types of transport here. So, number one, what's that? This is simple diffusion through a channel. Some people are confused. Okay, if there is a channel, isn't that supposed to be um, facilitated diffusion? No, facilitated diffusion is carrier, not a channel. I know that both of them are proteins, but they are different. If you need a carrier, you are facilitated diffusion. If you need just a channel, it's called simple diffusion. These channels are also known as watery channels. That's why they can permit the passage of water-soluble molecules or ions, also known as polar. Water-soluble, lipid-insoluble. So this was number one. Let's go to number two. Okay, so sodium out, potassium in. Sodium out, potassium in. What's that? This is the sodium potassium ATPase, a classic example of primary active transport. I exert the ATP myself, that's why it has an ATPase activity. This will lead to sodium out, sodium out, sodium out, sodium out, sodium out. We have lots of positives outside of the cell, which will lead to what? Yes, they will repel each other forcing the sodium to go inside the cell because here it's very positive and sodium is positive so they will repel each other called repulsion and then sodium goes inside of the cell do i need energy for this step no the energy was exerted here but here the sodium goes by electrical gradient when sodium goes in it's a positively charged ion Another positively charged ion should go out. Hello, calcium. 
So this is a classic example of secondary active transport. It needs energy, it needs ATP, but it doesn't exert the energy itself. It requires this one, the primary active transport. I'll give you like a pearl. If you transport two molecules against their concentration gradient or against their electrochemical gradient, you're primary active. If you only transport one against its concentration gradient, it's called secondary active. Very cool. How about number four? This is the paracellular route. Another example of simple diffusion. No energy, no carrier. Some excellent students are so bored right now. Okay, I know all of this stuff. Why are you wasting my time? So, okay, let's go to the important stuff. Let's go to the pharmacology tie. So, here's the normal cell. Primary active transport, sodium out, potassium in, called sodium-potassium pump. And then when sodium accumulates outside of the cell, it will force sodium inside of the cell because there is lots of positives here. Sodium out, sodium in, calcium out. This is secondary active transport, also known as counter transport or anti-port. Why? Because one in and one out. Two molecules in two different directions. This is normal. And imagine that this cell is the cardiac cell or cardiac myocyte. Myo means muscle, site means cell. Now, while using the drug digoxin, okay, disturbance is gonna happen. Digoxin is gonna inhibit this channel, the sodium potassium ATPase. Now, so sodium is not getting out, it's not getting out, it's not get getting out. So there is nothing to push sodium into the cell. Sodium is not gonna go in, calcium is not gonna go out because the secondary active transport was dependent on the primary active transport. What will happen to calcium? Calcium will accumulate inside the cell. Calcium, 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 contraction. Calcium, contraction. So if this is the cardiac myocyte, digoxin or digitalis will increase cardiac contractility which means the ability of heart of your heart to contract. Digoxin increases conductility, so the heart pumps stronger, stronger, more contraction, stronger contraction. This is what digoxin does. So, what's the mechanism of action of digoxin? It inhibits the primary active sodium-potassium ATPs. As a result, there is an inhibition of the secondary active sodium-calcium ATPs. Calcium accumulates inside the cell, leading to cardiac contraction. Pharmacology tie number two. So this is the normal cell. Every cell in your body it has what? Sodium, potassium, ATPase. This is normal. Sodium out, potassium in. When you use beta blockers, they block this amazing sodium, potassium, ATPase. Sodium is not getting out. Potassium is not getting in. Potassium is left outside. When there is lots of potassium outside, which is called the extracellular fluid, there is what? Hyperkalemia. Hyper means high. Kalium means potassium. Emia means blood. By the way, kalium is from an Arabic word. Okay. Kalium. Okay. The original is Arabic. It's, that's why we call it L Kelly. It's like L Gibra. It's also an Arabic word. L Kelly, L Gibra. So, kalium is an Arabic word. What does kalium mean? Alkali. Ooh, so potassium should be alkali. Yes. Yes. We're going to talk about this when we talk about acid base disturbance and stuff like that. Please remember this. K means kalium, which is an alkaline thing. That's why when you have acidosis, let's say that you have lots of hydrogen ions outside of the cell, and you're gonna buffer this hydrogen, you will let hydrogen in, and you will let potassium out. Let the acid in, let the alkali out to buffer the acidosis in the blood. Wow! About two-thirds or 60% of your total body weight is made of water. 
But why water? I'm sure your professor did not explain this to you. Why not juice? Why not liquid mercury or liquid nitrogen or any other fluid? Pay attention. There's something called specific heat. Okay, it's the amount of energy needed to increase the temperature of a fluid. By the way, water has a very high specific heat, also known as thermal capacity, which means it's very difficult to boil water and it's very difficult to freeze water. And water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, which is not expected because if you follow the physics logic, water should boil in a temperature below zero. I don't remember the exact number, but this was expected. However, water is an exception. It boils at 100 Celsius and it freezes at zero Celsius. That's why your body can bear extreme temperatures. I was born in Egypt. It was very hot, but my body didn't melt. Why? Because it's very difficult to boil water and my body is made of water. When I came to the United States in the winter, it's so cold. Thank God I didn't freeze. Why? Because it's very difficult to freeze water due to its high specific heat. You got it? It's very difficult to boil water. It's very difficult to freeze water. It takes lots of energy to do that. Second thing, water has something called the capillary action. If this is a basin of water and this is a large test tube, okay, water is gonna be at the same level. But if this is a capillary tube, a very thin tube, water is gonna rise to this level. This is called capillary action. This is how trees, okay, which are very tall, get water from the soil. They have very thin capillaries like this. I don't know what they call them and they pull water up. How does your body use the capillary action? Tears. When you drain tears through the lacrimal ducts, it's capillary action. Breastfeeding. How the baby suckle the breast of his mommy? It's through capillary action. Milk flowing through the, the ducts of lactation. I forgot their name. Third thing. Water is an excellent solvent. That's why sodium can dissolve in water, potassium can dissolve in water, chloride can dissolve in water, and when they are dissolved in water, they can pass, they can pass with water through these channels that are watery channels. Remember, they are water soluble, so they cannot cross the lipid bilayer membrane. They need the channel. They go with water. Fourth, redox reaction, which stands for reduction oxidation reactions to kill bugs, also known as reactive oxygen species, which I think I've talked about before. We'll talk about later when we talk about pathology and infectious disease and all of this stuff. So that's why 60% of your total body weight is made of water. It's great. You should be grateful that you have water. Now, total body water. If you're an adult male, total body water equals 60% of your body weight in kilograms. So let's say that you are 100 kilograms, which is, you should be in the gym like 24-7. This is so heavy. Your total body water is 60% times 100 equals 60 kilograms of water in your body, which happens to be equal 60 liters of water in your body. Because remember, the density of your water is 1 kilogram over liter, if you remember your physics. If you have 60 kilograms of water, the volume is 60 liters of water. Cool. An adult female, total body water is 50% of the total body weight. Why less water in female? Because they have more fat. And as you know, water and oil don't mix. More fat, less water. Why do they have more fat? Because they have estrogen. Estrogen does what? Widens the hips, increase the fat, give the female contour and nice curves. More fat, less water. Then, total body water in an infant equals 75% of body weight. That's why dehydration is dangerous in infants. 
Oh, I thought if they had, like, lots of water, they should be less labile to dehydration. Nope. I'll give you a simplistic example. Not just simple, but simplistic. Imagine that you have two houses. House number one has 60% of its structure made of wood. And house number two has 70% of its structure made of wood. And imagine that both of them are infested with a bug that eats wood, for example, a bug or a small animal or whatever. Which house is in more danger? The answer is this house, because it has 70%, 75% of its structure made of wood. It's more labile to destruction or dehydration. One last point. If you are obese, you have less water. Why? Again, more fat, less water. Total body water, 60% of your body weight. So let's say that your weight is 100, total body water is 60 kilograms. Now, this 60% is divided into 40% of the total body weight is in the intracellular fluid, which is inside the cell. 20% of the total body weight, not of the 60%, no, no, no. 20% of the total body weight is in the extracellular fluid. Why do we have more water in the intracellular fluid than the extracellular fluid? Because you are not a sponge, kiddo. When I shake your hands, you don't just squish water all over the place. Most of the water is inside your cell, not outside. You are not a sponge, and you don't have square pants either. Let's dive deeper. 60% of body weight is water, two-thirds in the intracellular, one-third in the extracellular. You have more water in the intracellular because you're not a sponge. Now let's go to the extracellular fluid. One-fourth is in the plasma. The majority of the extracellular fluid is in the interstitial space. So let's draw that. So here is your nice cell. Here is your nice blood vessel. What's inside the cell? Intracellular fluid. Outside, we have the interstitial and we have the plasma inside the blood vessel. The majority of fluid is in the cell. Okay, now let's talk about the extracellular. The majority of the extracellular fluid is in the interstitium, not the plasma. Question, why do we have more fluid in the interstitium than the plasma? Good question. Let's meet Sam the soldier. Hey Sam, why do you have fluid in the interstitium more than your plasma and by the way thanks for your service okay my son i'll tell you why because in war i'm very likely to bleed because of gunshot wounds and stuff like that so when i bleed i lose plasma fluid but thankfully i have higher amount of fluid in the interstitial space they act as a reservoir they replace my plasma when i need it now, here is a trick question for you. Is the fluid inside your red blood cell considered intracellular or extracellular? And the answer is, it's intracellular inside the red blood cells. This is a great illustration here. So, inside the cell is the intracellular fluid. Inside the red blood cell is the intracellular fluid. Outside of your cell is the extracellular fluid. Between the cells, it's called the interstitium. Between red blood cells, it's called the plasma. Okay, you have told us all about water, but there is an important point. Not all waters are created equal. We have obligated water and free water. The obligated water is obligated to follow electrolytes. It follows sodium. So when there is, let's say, sodium here, and it's attracting chloride after it, it will attract water after them. So water is gonna move this way. What type of water is this? This is obligated water, it follows electrolytes. There's another type of water called free water. It doesn't follow electrolytes, it's free. Created by the loop of Henle with this one sodium, one potassium, two chloride channel. If you remember your physiology, we had the loop of Henle like this, like this. And here we had a channel called one sodium, one potassium, two chloride. 
what did it do? It removed the electrolyte from the filtrate, leaving the water inside without electrolytes because this segment of loop of Henle is impermeable to water. So when you remove the electrolytes, you end up with free water in the tubule. The kidney depends on this free water to concentrate urine and to dilute urine. This free water is influenced by the antidiuretic hormones in the collecting tubules because ADH adds the aqua porine channels for water. So let's summarize. You know from physics that water is special. That's why 60% of your body weight is made of water. You're not a sponge. That's why the majority of fluid is in the intracellular compartment. We need a reservoir for in case of bleeding to supply the blood which was lost in hemorrhage. That's why the majority of the extracellular fluid is in the interstitium. Boom! You know that your normal blood volume is 5 liters, 3 liters of plasma, 2 liters of red blood cell. How did we get the 3 liters of plasma? Okay, imagine that you are a normal adult and your body weight is like 60 kilograms, okay? This is very rare nowadays because we eat lots of food. So 60 kilograms and you know that the plasma is what is 5% of your total body weight. So... 5% times 60, 3, 3 liters of plasma. That's how you get it. Very nice, because remember, 60% is water, 40% in the intracellular fluid, 20% in the extracellular fluid. Then we have 15% in the interstitium and 5% in the plasma. Multiply the 5% times your body weight and you get the plasma volume. Clinical take home points. Let's take it to the next level. Dehydration is a serious problem in infants. They are dependent on their caregiver. They can't ask for water. Their bodies are 70% made of water. Digoxin will lead to increased cardiac contractility by inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase. Beta blockers will lead to hyperkalemia by inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase. Okay, quiz time. This is question number three. The two previous questions were in the last video. How many liters of normal saline do you have to infuse into the patient in order to deliver one liter to his plasma compartment? Did you know that now you can go to my Patreon page, click on video notes and choose hematology for example. You will see all of my hematology notes. There are like 150 of them. You can download them, print them, view them, do whatever you want. Go to patreon.com forward slash medicos.